All right, this next speaker has a special place in my godless heart, and that <laughs> I first met them a couple years ago, and they were dressed as the doctor. And I'm, come on, who doesn't love that? Um, also, he makes a mean biscotti, super awesome, super smart, worked with the SSA, the FBB, the Pathfinders Project, and if you've read the title of his talk, spoiler alert, he got malaria. So everybody, big welcome for Ben Blanchard. Hi, everybody. You are all my family, and I love you. Also, I was told that if, um, so we have comments after, or sorry, questions and comments after the talk. I'm around. I'm very accessible. And so anyone who starts talking when I'm talking, I get to shoot. They gave us guns. <laughs> Yay! The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to take my phone and put it on mute. <gasps> Why might I be telling you that I'm putting my phone on mute? Give you a second if you want to put your phone on mute. Eh? Eh? Other thing, while well, you have your phone out, you, know, you might want to follow Ben's sweater vest. <laughs> what a crazy thought. Anyway, so I'm Ben, Ben's sweater vest, Ben Blanchard, that guy in the sweater vest, or that person that got malaria and almost died. Those are all acceptable things to shout at me when I'm in the street, in case you care. Um, and I am really, really lucky um, from working in this community, this wonderful atheist, skeptic, humanist, half a dozen other labeled community, mm -hmm. I was very blessed and was able to go on a year-long humanist service trip. And since you guys are my family, I have a slideshow of my trip, and that's what my presentation is on. Yay! Travel slides! No, I'm joking. Um, but not about following me on Twitter. You actually have to do that. Um, so I worked for a year volunteering in local country or in local organizations all around the world in eight countries uh, with the Pathfinders Project. It was the uh, first travel initiative uh, for the Humanist Service Corps uh, put on by the Foundation Beyond Belief. That being said, it was a collaborative effort between several organizations, lots and lots of people, and I can't say enough good things about the organization. Um, through this, we traveled to Cambodia, Uganda, Ghana, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Ecuador, Colombia, and Guatemala. Uh, we spent more than a month in every location. A couple we spent about three months in, and it was just a wonderful experience to both do work and service and experience new cultures. Um, we were working the entire time with local NGOs, so non-government organizations, in those countries, about a dozen, um, in the areas of clean water, education, human rights, and environmental work, things that we can all get around. And we worked only in secular organizations because we are a humanist, big H humanist, uh, service initiative, that's what we would do. Uh, and so in my speech, we'll be talking about a couple things. These are uh, people accused of witchcraft in Northern Ghana. And you know, I'll be talking about the Humanist Service Corps more than a little bit. That being said, you'll also get to see some fun travel photos, but I'll be, we'll be talking a lot about witches and the Humanist Service Corps. That's why I'm here, no big deal. Um, and I'm going to school you on the supplies you need to do hard work and be as happy as she is, because look at how happy she is, and not get disgusted by what the awful things that are happening around the world that we can actually, a lot of things that we can do to prevent and make the world a better place. And so I'll just start and dive right in. Uh, this is one of the first photos that was taken of us when we were actually abroad. Uh, this is us in Cambodia um, in our school. We spent a little bit over a month working in a school teaching English to children who would eventually work in tourism industry in Cambodia. Uh, this was the first time I've traveled out of the country for more than a little bit of time. Definitely a great, wonderful thing. It began to get a little sketch. Uh, here's a picture of me and Michelle when we were at a beautiful big dam that um, our translator and co-teacher brought us to. Um, we didn't realize until afterwards that this particular dam was an area where the Khmer Rouge, which was the uh, communist takeover of Cambodia, they put up a dam uh, to industrialize the country um, and didn't really tell anyone, so hundreds of people died when they put it up and flooded. Um, this was an area where everyone else knew except for us. And so when they were there, we were like really excited to see this big, beautiful dam, a big piece of uh, industrial architecture in an area that had very little. 
And it wasn't until quite a bit afterwards when you realized exactly what was going on. Um, a little bit later, we explored the temples, which was fun. Uh, this particular photo is fun, because right after this photo was taken, I vomited everywhere. <laughs> Just everywhere for like three days. <laughs> Not really sure how, because up until that point, I'd only been drinking bottled water, but things happen. It, it happens when you travel abroad. These are the risks that we take. I was fine. It was just not a particularly pleasant three days. Uh, that being said, this is one of the temples uh, in the Angkor Wat sect. Uh, it was a beautiful area. And there are a couple more photos. And you can certainly go online and, and take a look at our other photos at pathfindersproject.com. Uh, Wendy Weber, who we traveled with, is a spectacular photographer. And she said that if I didn't give her a shout out, she'd murder me in my sleep. Wendy Weber Photography. Uh, that's actually her in the back. Um, it was at the, uh, this is the pagoda that we taught in. Um, the local Buddhist monks were very kind and offered the school that we were teaching with a, their pagoda to teach English in, which is amazing. We also taught to the monks um, in this area. Um, both me and the director of the project, Connor, went and shook hands with the monks, and Wendy was just about to, and they were like, no, 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 no. So in Buddhism, in Cambodia, it's quite a bit different than the Buddhism that I'm used to from the US. Uh, one of the big things is that uh, women can't touch monks or like ever become monks. Uh, there's an older story to where a, oh, hello. Uh, there's an older story to where a, there was, there used to be female monks. There was a very, very beautiful female monk. She had long black hair. Um, and the, uh, she touched a male monk and they attacked her because she was so beautiful and killed her. And as a result, there can be you no know, more female monks because obviously it was her fault. Obviously something that I was not quite used to considering I grew up in the US where Buddhism is very Zen and lovey-dovey, but to experience a religion in such a dogmatic and axiomatically different way was quite a bit of a culture shift. I'll be talking about culture shift and privilege quite a bit in my talk because ultimately that's one of the biggest things I took away from this, just realizing how different the world is than any of us can really realize. The other big thing that our women did that no other women in the area did was they drank in front of men. So if you ask a man, the Cambodian women don't drink. Ever, ever, ever. If you ask the women, they drink. They just don't do it in front of the men because it's unladylike and lots of cultural aspects there. And so when they drank, and oftentimes drank significantly more than the Cambodian men, they were all surprised and we were excited. It was a really, really great, odd bonding experience. Who knew that alcohol can help bonding? <laughs> See, I keep thinking that I'm gonna drink here, but then in the morning I never remember doing it, so it obviously hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yes, um, that being said, this was also one of the great first communities that we connected with abroad. Um, one of the big things I experienced in every developing nation I've ever been in is that communities feel significantly stronger than I am used to in the US. Mm -hmm. Now I feel strongly connected to the atheist community, the atheist, humanist, secular, that community, and they've always been there for me, but generally in society I don't feel that same connection. But in large part abroad, they have that connection with their immediate geographic communities, just as many people have their church communities, and that's something I'll get to a little bit later in the talk, but the first big one that I felt connected to, which was pretty awesome, um, that being said, in Cambodia, we also got to do work on clean water. Um, so we were in a very, very rural area, and I'm a big fan of clean water. My background's in microbiology, and so just water is really important, learning about the bacteria, trying to figure out how we can help out with that. That's awesome. Uh, in Cambodia, it's a very wet area, and so there are different challenges with water, um, but we got to dig some wells, learn a little bit about it. Um, in this area, they have essentially an auger. So if, also, if you've ever been ice fishing, it's about the same length, to where you just drill it in by hand, and then you stick a pole in later. We were big, strong people, and so we were like, oh, we can do this, because they only went a couple inches at a time. Turns out there's a reason they only went a couple inches at a time. Uh, if you went much farther than that, it got stuck, and you kind of broke the pipe. And so we broke water in Cambodia. Like, <laughs> it took a, a little while to fix. Another aspect of privilege to where we, being the sm smart, strong Americans, we thought we can just do it. Turns out there was a very valid reason that we just 
didn't grasp until we ran across it. It was a really good learning experience, and we were able to fix it. No harm, no foul, just a couple hours of extra work on us. Um, after Cambodia, we went to Uganda, which I actually loved the country of Uganda because so many people wore sweater vests. If it wasn't for the whole, yeah. It, they're my people. It's, it, if it wasn't for the whole kill the gays thing, I would go back, but I can't go back. Yeah, they have a sexual deviancy thing when you enter the country, and the first time I didn't read through it, now that I know it a little bit better, I can't go back, which is really sad. But it's a beautiful country. Um, and the first area that we worked at, and probably my favorite location to date, uh, was the Kesese Humanist Primary School. This was essentially the, hu the only science-based school in the country. They taught religion comparatively. Um, the motto, their motto was, with science being in progress. And this is a country to where, in public schools, they choose between the Christian and the Muslim course load. And so this was the school that you went to if you didn't want religious indoctrination. It was amazing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Uganda is one of the most uh, religiously indoctrinated countries in the world. They have very, very high levels of religiosity. It's also a very different form of both Christianity and Islam than I'm used to in the US, but generally pretty exciting. Uh, also, their symbol is the happy humanist, which is just awesome. Uh, the building that we were staying in, everywhere there was happy humanists. The light fixtures were happy humanists. On the walls, it was just fun, fun, fun. Um, and these are the kids. They, uh, this is actually only a small section of them. Uh, so they were taught um, from the preschool to about grade seven. Um, which accompanies a whole range of ages. Uh, some of the kids were my age, which was exciting. Um, but yeah, I truly love all of them. Um, and Ben's. So when I was abroad, uh, since I had worked so much with the Secular Student Alliance, when I saw that they were in need of pens and writing utensils, which were fairly expensive there, um, I wrote, to, I mentioned a message to the Secular Student Alliance and was like, hey, can you send some pens, kind of jokingly? And then they were like, sure, and sent a huge shipment of pens that the kids are still using to date. So thank you, Secular Student Alliance. You're in here somewhere, you're also outside. If you guys don't currently support them, you should. <laughs> yeah, which is, yeah, they're certainly one of the best organizations in the world. Also in Uganda, which is exciting. Um, and pens, which are not really, we don't think of them as a necessary educational material in the US because they're so common. You find them lying on the floor in schools. Here, kids would fight over the small nubs to just write in their school equipment because systematically, they are impoverished. And luckily, here it wasn't as bad. In the next school we were at, um, water was actually their largest uh, educational requirement. Luckily, I could say, say, due to a Foundation Beyond Belief grant, they were able to have a water system. Um, at the next school we were at, they weren't, didn't, and so each child was allowed two cups of water per 10-hour class day. The thought of water as an educational material was difficult for me, significantly more difficult for our director, Connor, who had worked for, as a special, educator, or a special education teacher for several years, and it's just one of the many mind flips that we experienced. Um, and I got to teach science in Uganda. I was a science teacher in Uganda. It was so exciting. I got to teach physics and math and sexual deviation. <laughs> so um, on the list here, uh, we see sex deviations including bestiality, incest, homosexuality, lesbianism, oral sex, and masturbation. I do at least a couple of those fairly regularly. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously, I chose this. I, I taught this curriculum very carefully. That being said, it was actually significantly better on sex education generally than in the U.S. Um, due to the epidemic of HIV/AIDS um, and the fact that early marriages were so common. Specifically, I can say, say they taught a lot about sex, sex education, sexual predation, and condom use, which was excellent because I got to teach condom use to people in Africa, which is exciting. Um, but I also had to tread lightly on sexual deviation, because it's on national tests, and so they need to know how to answer in order to pass. It was just very difficult, because once again, if it's not clear, I do some of these. Uh, 
the other wonderful thing about Kasese specifically is that every um, Friday or Saturday they had debate. And as much of, as some of you guys think you're really angry, firebrand atheists, JT Eberhards, you're out there somewhere, these kids, they assert their atheism. Um, all of their teachers are Christian, um, due to the fact that you can't get atheist teachers really in Uganda for obvious reasons. Um, but many of these kids are free thinkers, and one of my favorite moments was when a student told a teacher very authoritatively that I will not allow your superstition to dictate my education. <laughs> And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I did not have that amount of guts growing up. I, didn't, I, I don't know if I have that amount of guts now to tell my teacher that. But those kids, they were feisty. Um, specifically, uh, third, or sorry, second to the left, her name was Phoebus. We talked about taking her with us because she was just so feisty and amazing. Um, when I was teaching science, one of the things that I did was I asked my kids in the beginning of the section what they wanted to do when they grew up because I care about that sort of thing. And most of them answered that they wanted to be like shopkeeps, they wanted to maybe go into local government, some of them wanted to be farmers. Um, and I teach science like a science evangelist because I love science and I teach critical thinking. Um, in many developing nations, science is taught as rote memorization which is difficult because you can't really explore critical thinking when you're just reciting memorized lines. And if you, as I often did, recite those memorized lines in a different order, it is wrong, which is difficult to have my students tell me I'm wrong when I'm not, but it happened quite a bit. Um, and, but after a couple days, they really began to enjoy science in the same way that I, in the same way that so many of us do. And at the end of my several week stint, Many of them wanted to come back with the U.S. and become scientists. And many of them wanted to study science locally in Uganda. Uganda is working on a space program, and one of my students in the beginning of the class hardly answered, and in the end asked about rockets. And I had to spend so many hours, A, researching rockets, because I'm a biologist, and then teaching them about rockets for physics. It was inspiring and just amazing at the grasp that they had. So this was the second school where water was actually at a prime. We didn't realize this when we first began. Uh, it wasn't until a couple weeks in that we understood the issue of water um, at this secondary school. And so one of our first weeks there, uh, we set up a um, JREF style um, practice activity to where they would use a pendulum to try and divine water. Now they didn't know what pendulums were, so we were like, some people in the US think that you can use pendulums to find water. They do it like this, and I had spent many hours the night before making little pendulums from little crystalline rocks I'd found on the street. And we were assigned half of the kids to say, yes, this works, and half of them to say, no, it doesn't. And for them to try and figure out, to just feel out the scientific method to try and test it. And with a little nudging, they were able to. Obviously, that's just, this is much more a US-style curriculum than it is Ugandan-style curriculum. And so it took a little bit longer than we were expecting, but it was at the end, amazing, while so many of the kids were still vehemently saying, yes, it can, you assigned it, it can, so obviously can. Um, they did, many of them began to understand that you can test hypotheses, which is just an amazing thing to be able to teach. Um, that being said, we used a bit of the school's water, which the director didn't want to tell us was at a premium, but we figured it out later and felt awful for obvious reasons. There is the little pendulum that I made. Isn't it pretty? I spent like a half hour on that first one. <sighs> I'm not an arts and craft person. I should have had Surly Amy send me one. Anyway, um, one of the other really awesome things about working, so this was more central Uganda than our first school, which was closer to the border of the, uh, of the Congo. Um, we drank Marua. So I'm not a beer person. Uh, Marua is essentially a really, really thick beer that they put hot water in. And it was not my taste, but it's what you did. And so you talked with the community, and I was smiling, because when they took my photo to smile, that meant I could stop drinking. <laughs> that was a genuine smile. The other fun thing about this particular 
section, is that both me and Wendy had worn things covering our heads, and so they assumed we were Muslim, which was fun. Um, this was a very Christian area, because our very Muslim areas are very Christian areas. They're areas that have multiple religions. Uh, this was a very Christian area, and so they thought we were Muslim, and like they were treating us like Muslims. And, we, and it was only me and Wendy, neither Connie nor Michelle, and so we were trying to figure it out. We figured it out about halfway through when they were like, you really shouldn't be drinking alcohol. To which I assumed they thought, like, because I had red cheeks, and I like that you have flush, and I was like, no, it's fine. And they're like, okay. So. <laughs> Fun times. Um, that being said, I did have some of my best experiences at the second school. Um, we did a lot of environmental work, and so we purchased trees and other plants and planted them with the kids, and we talked about nature. Um, in this particular area, it was very desertous, and so adding greenery to the landscape was just amazing. Also, that's just a really good photo of me. <laughs> the colors are so crisp. Wendy Weber is a wonderful photographer. I have to say her name three more times throughout my speech. <laughs> After we went to uh, Uganda, we spent several months in Uganda, we went off to Ghana. Uh, we worked with two organizations. One was the Alliance for African Women's Initiative, also known as AFAWI. Um, and then we went to the witch camps, which I'll talk a lot about, but Anifawi, which I'll briefly touch on, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. Um, they address the fact that so many women cannot have good educations because there's stigma around menstruation, and so when someone is menstruating, they are unable to go to class, which equates to sometimes a week per month where they aren't going to class, and as a result, they drop behind. This also leaves huge social stigmas, and as a result, women oftentimes don't have leadership positions. So one of the major things that Afawi does is they teach, uh, or they create clubs in these um, schools, and they make sure women are in charge, and that women are empowered, and they do things about hygiene, and so they educate. And it's just an amazing organization. And luckily, as an SSAer, I was able to do a lot of work in this, because I know how to do student organizations. And it was amazing. That being said, you can't tell quite at this, my face is really, really red. <laughs> I'll get to why that was in a second, but yeah. Um, every day we took a, a trocha, which is a non-city bus. Um, one of the awesome things about this was that, well, awesome, was that every time you wanted to take a bus, you had to wait until the bus filled. And so oftentimes that was like 10 minutes from the bus gets there to the bus leaves. One time we were sitting in a terminal for like three hours just waiting, and other and the locals knew how the system worked much better than we did, and so they just took taxis instead of the buses because it was not going to happen. And so we ended up just having to take a taxi. Um, that being said, there's a lot of fumes there, and so I was nauseous a lot. wasn't really getting why. Um, here I am at uh, one of the slave castles. While we're in the area, um, our local host made sure that we had weekends off because Ghana has a very rich and exciting history, um, specifically with slave culture. Uh, so we went to one of the castles where slaves were held. Um, they have a room that is where several dozen slaves were held. It's roughly the size of a small closet. And so a small group of you can go in and they turn off the lights and so you can begin to experience what it's like. Very little. Um, I almost passed out and then we took his photo and then I actually passed out. Because <sighs> I had malaria. And so can you. Um, so malaria is a fun little parasite. It goes in, and it eats your blood cells, causes them to lice, your blood toxicity goes us up, your oxygen goes down, you just begin to die. It's, it's really awful. Um, we were all on anti-malarials. As we find out, anti-malarials are not 100% effective. So I contracted um, in Cambodia three, four months prior, and I thought I had like a stomach thing going on, and so I really didn't talk about it. And I thought, and like I was sweating a lot, but I'm a big guy. I'm sweating bullets now. And it's hot in African countries. And like we didn't have air conditioning or fans or anything. And so there were lots of factors as to why I was as sick as long as I was. I was also really stubborn and kept being like, it's, it's fine. I'm just not hungry. But yeah, I ended up passing out. I had malaria. I almost died. Um, I'm an opportunist, so I used it as a fundraiser. I met, I got a lot of money for the organizations we were with at the time. Uh, so the major symptom of malaria is fever. The major symptom of generosity is happiness. Gets malaria, makes jokes about it to avoid thinking about how serious it is. <laughs> Fun fact, you can't see the storm clouds when you focus on the silver lining. 
Silver linings are awesome. So yeah, I, um, I almost died. It was awful. Due to mosquitoes, um, with the exception of humans, mosquitoes kill more than any other animal, insect, anything. They're just awful. We should really just wipe them out. I, I want to wipe them out. Group that I don't want to wipe out. Women accused of witchcraft in Ghana. When I was in Ghana, I was one of the few people who didn't hold that belief. Uh, so witchcraft belief in Ghana is incredibly prevalent, over 90%. It's very similar to belief in angels in the US. In the US, the vast majority of people believe in angels. They don't talk about it because nowadays we don't need angels to explain things when miraculous things happen. We are able to give better explanations than we used to, but it's a belief, it's a meme that lingers. And unfortunately, in Ghana, it's witchcraft. And so what happens in rural areas where education is not as much, where health measures are not as much, they oftentimes need an excuse as to, or an explanation rather, as to why someone got sick. They need an explanation as to why someone had a miscarriage. We need these things for our own mentalities. And a really convenient explanation is, which? And unfortunately, when many people are accused of witchcraft, they are immediately killed. It is awful. We don't know how many women are killed because it's so prevalent. Certainly hundreds every year, probably thousands, maybe more. And it is terrifying and awful. The ones who are essentially able to escape the lynch mob coming after them, oftentimes when you're talking to these women, they would jump out of a window. They would, ha or their son would hold the door shut while they got out the back door. And they would come to these camps because it is the only chance they have of living which is just terrifying. Um, this was part of the walk to water. So in the camp we were at, it was about a two hour walk for water. Once again, we were spry, young, 20 something Americans. Um, so due to the situation of how witchcraft accusations come about, um, it's oftentimes older women who no longer have a husband to essentially give them social authority, um, but oftentimes still have monetary wealth who are accused. Um, as a result, the average age in the witchcraft community, or sorry, not in the witchcraft community, uh, the average age in people accused of witchcraft is 70. And you, you have 70 year old Ghanaian women walking two hours every day for water. It's not a good situation for obvious reasons. Also, carrying water on your head is really hard. Um, ours was only half full because I couldn't hold it up otherwise. The other women were able to carry it completely full. They had larger containers because once again, they did it every day. They know how to do it. They have the skills. We tried. Connor was able to do it pretty well. The rest of us struggled. We were eventually able to do it because we did it several times, but definitely a steep learning curve. Um, this gentleman is uh, the fetish priest. Um, so he, that means he's the priest of the local Christian, animus, Islam, just generic religion that governs this place. Um, so the reason these camps exist is because the local belief is that they have a special healing energy to where you can't have evil thoughts, and so if you have powers, nothing bad happens. I should mention at this point that many men have powers, and that isn't a negative thing when a man has it, it's only a negative thing when women have powers. <sighs> isn't that interesting? And so he became um, the priest of the area because he was selected um, by the spirits. And they tried to explain to us the system of God, gods, spirits, local spirits, angels. And it was really complicated and I didn't understand. Wendy had a better grasp of it because she has a background. She went to Yale Divinity School. Um, I was frustrated because this was the excuse system that they had to have concentration camps. So I was frustrated at this gentleman. The other particularly aggravating thing is that um, he was selected by the spirits uh, for this position when his dad died, he, or his father's staff and stone bag thing, that didn't translate well, um, were given to him by the spirits. And they just, and we were like, wait, what does that mean? And he was like, yeah, they appeared in my room. Now, I, I believe that they did not appear in the room. I believe that someone knew what was going on, and so someone is aware that this is all bullshit. I can swear, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. 
And so someone is aware that this is utter bullshit and that this is used to destroy the lives and livelihoods of thousands of women and they're just okay with it. And that's really fucking frustrating to me. Um, so yes, he has to know at least a little, at minimum that he cheated to get where he was. I would not be surprised if he knows that it's all bullshit. But it's what he does. People get stuck in positions. People have behavioral inertia. And it's a very different situation. I have a hard time levying blame. I'm just really, really upset. These are the huts that they live in. Um, so every time someone else is accused of witchcraft and is not killed by the lynch mob, and they make it to one of the camps, um, they have to pay a fee to be cleansed. And then to have a house, there's another price. Oftentimes they do that by promising daughters or granddaughters to the village elders, which is also really, really scary. But this is the house that they live in. This is actually the nicest one. It was very nice. Uh, most did not have roofs that well. Most were not so complete. There's a hole behind that door, but you can't see it quite in this photo. This is a better example of what the roofs looked like. They were falling apart. So thatch roofs can be very effective. When they are made by people who know how to do thatch roofs with the correct materials, when they are made with what's available by people who have been doing it for a while, they're better than nothing, but at the same time, they last maybe about six months of actually holding off water. Unfortunately, they cost money. And as a result, after that six months, they just have to deal with all of their things being wet. They have to deal with the fact that they don't have protection from the elements anymore because they can't afford another roof, which is frustrating. Um, so on the right is one of the women that was accused of witchcraft, um, and she was telling us our story. Uh, the gentleman on the left uh, works with one of the organizations that we were working with at the time. Um, he is also uh, the descendant of one of the elders of this village, and so he's able to come in and out without any problem. And he also spoke English, so he acted as our translator. We knew that sometimes he was telling us what we wanted to hear, and so one of our longer term goals is to learn Dogbani, which is the local language. Obviously, you can't get Duolingo for that. You can't get Rosetta Stone, so we're figuring it out. But it was a difficult situation. So she was explaining to us how she was accused. Um, this story just tears at me. Um, so they had a dance in the area, and she got up prepared, and she went, and when she went, um, a woman had accused several people, including her, of witchcraft. And so it was about 20 women that were accused. All of them had a trial to where they take a chicken, slit its throat, and depending on the area, if it keeps flapping afterwards, then you're a witch or you're not. If it falls on one side, then you're a witch then, or you're not. Or if it keeps moving around, you're a witch or you're not. Every person says it a little bit differently, and so it's difficult. One might say that you're just using it as an excuse to send people away. In this case, she was not or her test showed that she was innocent. Unfortunately, the accusation is enough to mean that you can't be there anymore and you have to go to a camp. So she was, her, her chicken test said that she was innocent and she still has to live in the concentration camp. Not a fun situation. Uh, the other particularly aggravating thing is that the baseline for an, an accusation of witchcraft is a dream in which this person appears. So a person had a dream to which she was in it, and that was enough for the accusation. She came up, pos or she came up innocent on the test of a chicken being killed, and she is still sent to a concentration camp. This is not a fun situation. <laughs> There were kids there, which is nice. They have a school. Um, unfortunately, when you enter the camps, you essentially can't ever really leave. We were at one of the nicest camps, and so it wasn't as bad as a lot of the other camps, um, but it certainly was a difficult area. The area, uh, the building that we're looking at, actually, actually the pharmacy. So Ghana has a healthcare scheme to where it's essentially universal healthcare. Um, and so everyone gets healthcare as a foreigner without being on that. My malaria treatment was like $30 which is a tenth, a hundredth, a thousandth of what it is in the US. So yay, Ghana healthcare. Unfortunately, people accused of witchcraft don't get that benefit. They had a pharmacy which was stocked with the local equivalent of Tums, like a Tylenol thing, an herb tea, 
and a couple of other not particularly effective medications, which is very frustrating. Oftentimes, the locals recognize that it just didn't do anything. Also, they didn't have a pharmacist there to be able to like determine what you need. And so they just went with herbalism as their remedies, which, as we know, has problems. Um, I have to move on just for time reasons. Um, and so next we went to the Dominican Republic in Haiti, where we were building latrines. It was really exciting. We were outdoors a lot. We got to dig a lot, get out the frustrations of being in witch camps, because it was very frustrating. And so we got to do something really positive. Uh, we were working with an organization called Children of the Border. Um, so on the Haitian side of the border, they were not terribly affected by the tsunami because they didn't actually have anything to begin with. So the infrastructure that they had wasn't destroyed because there wasn't any. And so obviously that ruins like supply trains, but they weren't as negatively affected. Um, that being said, there were several diseases which were brought onto the island um, by volunteers, well, very well-intentioned volunteers. Um, but as a result, community health is very important. And I learned a lot, a lot, a lot about community from this wonderful, wonderful area. Uh, we were in an area called La Fange Jeanette. Um, I have so many positive memories. Building latrines, one of the amazing things is that A, you guys were all really willing to give money. <laughs> like we, we raised more money uh, for latrines than any other location. And as a result, we were able to build several dozen latrines in Haiti. Yay. Yay, we're doing public health work. We're giving people necessities, yay. Um, Atheists did something really, really awesome in this area. Um, and we did it because of story-based uh, fundraising. So we found a little Claude, and he was just super, super fucking excited to have a latrine, because that's like what the other people had, and their family was so excited. Um, part of the agreement is that we brought in the supplies, and we brought in the mason to be able to do all the labor, and they just had to have the, a large enough hole dug. Um, and so lots of families had really big holes dug already, and so we were able to do all of the materials we had, plus another supply run of materials worth of latrines. It was amazing. And we got to build latrines, which, fun fact, we were not nearly as good as the locals at. I, I've done a lot of construction stuff. My dad is a DIYer. We build a guest house. We build lots of things. But we had things like electric drills and levels. When you have these things, things become easier. When you have enough supplies, when you have extra nails, you're able to do a different style of construction. When you're doing construction here, where you're using your machete to hack apart areas to essentially make two by fours to stabilize, they were infinitely better than us. Um, and we were just so incredibly happy to be able to be here. When we went to our first latrine, we assumed that we were just going to be going. It'd be empty. We'd be building on top. The mason would help out, kind of, but we had read the instructions. We knew what we were doing, kind of, and that we figured out. Luckily, when we got there, there were two dozen gentlemen from the area who were there, and they were excited to build because this was a community project. Even though, for the most part, only one family would be using each latrine, this is a community health project. They had done so much educational work that they knew what was happening. And as a result, everyone was so excited to be helping their community be healthier, to help their community prevent disease. They were so incredibly joyous to be building their community, something that in the US I never really felt that same energy from. And I wish, I wish, I wish we did. And we're getting better. But if we can catch up to the people of La Jeanette, and community building would be awesome. If we could build up with latrine building, that would be amazing, but <laughs> let's temper our desires. And so uh, the first latrine that we built by ourselves was awful. It was, it, we didn't know how to square things. There was a weird slant. It was not good at all. This was it. They, they, to they fixed it for us. <laughs> we were very happy that they fixed it for us. And from that point forward, we did what I think we should be doing, helping in ways that we know how to. We knew why the PVC pipe was important, because it allows methane gas to vent out. That was something that they hadn't been doing before that the CDC, the World Health Organization, lots of other organizations recommend. It was in our schematics. And that was something that we did. And that's a way that we could help. We used our knowledge to complement their skills and lived experience. 
because they do know how to build in their area better than we could. But just being able to do that and be able to help how we could by listening which was hard because they spoke Creole and none of us speak Creole. <laughs> we speak Spanish, which is kind of like Creole, but not at all. And so there was a definitely a communication gap, but when we were able to communicate, we were able to work collaboratively to help better the community, which is excellent. Uh, from there, we went to Ecuador, uh, where we were working with an organization called Agua Muna, uh, or Water Ecuador, if you're in the US. And it was an amazing experience. This is definitely one of the best organizations uh, certainly the best organizational model. Uh, so what they do is they collect donations uh, from the US and they support and subsidize the cost to turn normal water distribution centers into clean water distribution centers. Uh, we were on the island of Puna, which is the second largest island in Ecuador, the largest island outside of the Galapagos, and we were able to turn what was disgusting water that made people sick into clean water. Uh, there was one clinic on this entire giant island. Uh, the doctors constantly complained about the fact that everyone was getting sick because of the water. And we were able to do something about that. We were able to provide water at no higher cost to the people because of donations and expertise from the US. And the other amazing thing is that the water distributor stays the same. And so we were just, we were just giving an upgrade to an existing water distribution plant. I love that model because once again, we're collaborating in ways that are beneficial for all parties to make the world a better place and to make communities all around uh, Ecuador safer. That being said, a lot of what we did was sanding. <laughs> um, unfortunately, when we were waiting for the materials to arrive, we just we ha wanted to do something, and so we were doing construction work, which at that point we were pretty good at. And I'm also really good with a power sander. If any of you guys need help with power sanding, I'm really good at power sanding. Yay! Uh, when the materials arrived, this was my specialty, and so I got to read through the book. Uh, this was similar equipment to what I'd used stateside when I was designing my own lab, and it was excellent that my expertise was being used to its extent. And we were able to make Agua Pura, which was Puna, so this island in Ecuador, a huge island to where people could not afford to drink clean water. They were now, all of them were able to drink clean water at no higher cost, which is just amazing. We then moved to Colombia. We were working on similar projects. Um, I'm going to cut out a little bit of this just for time. But we got to make, we got to do a lot of advertising. Um, we built uh, composters and did a lot of environmental projects. Otherwise, it wasn't too terribly exciting, except for the fact that we got to build, or we got to fix a well. So a local American who had gone down there had fixed a well without really knowing what he was doing. And so we were able to actually fix the well so that we could fix what he had kind of broken. Yay. We also uh, got to teach um, a school which had one teacher for over 100 students. We were able to help uh, teach with that, moreover, design a curriculum bilingually on environmental work because we were working with an environmental organization to teach the kids just a little bit more about how to do things a little bit more efficiently in the area. I also built a lot of, com built a lot of composters. <laughs> My expertise in soil microbiology meant I built composters, which is actually really fun. Uh, from there, we went to Guatemala. Uh, in Guatemala, we had amazing experiences, which unfortunately I have to cut out most of. Um, that being said, this photo, I always show this photo, uh, this was of an atheist family in Guatemala. Um, I'm pretty sure it is the only atheist family in Guatemala. <laughs> There's also a very good chance that they are streaming this in Guatemala right now. So, hi, family. I love you guys. Um, they all spoke English, which was nice. Um, they were, many of them were blonde, which was not something we were expecting in Guatemala, but they were Guatemalan for several generations, as they were Guatemalan, we were not. But yeah, we had wonderful experiences with them. Um, the wealth disparity in Guatemala is insane. Uh, the organization that we were working with primarily was uh, Camino Seguro. Uh, they help people who live off of the dump. Um, they used to live in the dump until there, were, until there was a methane fire that smoldered for three days and untold dozens died. Now they live around the dump and every day go in to the dump. They harvest bed springs. They harvest plastic bottles. They do what it takes to survive. They respect each other, but they make roughly a dollar a day. And that's fortunately able to support the community. Uh, we acted as a school, or we worked with Camillo Seguro, uh, which is a school that teaches English, computer skills. Uh, they act as a supplement to the normal curriculum. 
And it was difficult. That being said, we'd already been through the witch camps, and as a result, nothing quite seems difficult after that. Um, I was very lucky in that after working with them and building balloon animals, another wonderful skill I had that we got to pull out, um, we were able um, to uh, work, I was able to work with another organization that worked with rural kids instead of urban kids. The rural children were very, very different because obviously different life experiences. Instead of people who lived in one of the densest cities in the world, they were children that lived with almost nothing in this huge mountainous area. I had the wonderful pleasure of a hour bus ride, half hour walk up a mountain, and then also a half hour walk up the mountain to go home. It was, the bus system frustrated me, but definitely a wonderful experience. That being said, I only have a couple minutes left. And so, hey look, I ate a Snickers that was done with a volcano. I toasted a Snickers on a volcano. <laughs> I really thought Snickers would retweet that, and they didn't. <laughs> if you're watching Snickers executives, shame. <laughs> um, so, I have just a couple minutes left. And so I'm going to ignite a fire in you so that you can also get malaria. Yay! In this case, malaria doesn't mean the disease. Uh, Ghana does not have malaria, especially the region we're in. They don't have it at all, so it's perfectly safe. Um, that being said, what malaria means to me is it means community. It means change. I should note this is day 180, not day 18, um, but as a result of, yeah, uh, I lost about 100 pounds in well, in 180 days, about 80 of that in about two months. <laughs> I was sick with malaria and didn't recognize it. I just thought I wasn't hungry. And so I slimmed down a lot really quickly. But what that means to me is personal change and a weird sort of growth and a weird sort of pride even over bad things. It means hard work that pays off, that supports communities, that shows that we care about more than ourselves. One of the really, really awful things about the atheist community right now is the perception that we don't care. I work at the Foundation Beyond Belief now. I work with, I'm the development director for We Are Atheism, who does Atheists Giving Aid. I used to work at the Secular Student Alliance. And despite all of the philanthropic work that we do as a community, because we do so much, there is still the perception that we don't. And it is unfair that we have to fight. And it is incredibly unjust and they should recognize our work for what it is, but they don't. And until that is remedied, until it is shown that beyond belief we do good work, we have to keep fighting and we have to work at 110% always. And that's not fair, but it's the world we live in. And so what malaria means to me is that we can do good work and we can fight against the stigma that we don't. What malaria means to me is that we learn and we grow from people that we wouldn't expect to learn and grow from that everything is a chance for growth, that everything, especially from people that we would never expect it from, that people accused of witchcraft can show us how to pull water correctly, because we didn't know. How do we ever know? We are so privileged we never had to do this, but they taught us how. Mm. What malaria means to me is that a community of thousands came together. We raised a lot of money for a lot of really good organizations while we are abroad. But beyond that, we had tens of thousands of people following us. What malaria means to me is the fact that we can come together, despite any schisms or rifts or whatever word we're using nowadays, despite any arguments we've ever had. We are a community, and we need to come together and be strong together, despite our differences. What malaria means to me is that there are awful things happening in the world right now that we can and need to fight. When I was working in the witch camps, one of the things that we did was we brought corn with us because we had money, we can afford to bring them food. And so when they were shucking the corn, they did the song, and obviously it's in Dogbani, but our translator told us it's talking about the community and that we can do it together. And the fact that we were there to join them, I cried afterwards because it was just a, such a beautiful thought. And it hurts me that we aren't able to do the same in the same way here because we have so many more resources. We have so much more that we can do to support our community. We can do more than shuck corn. We can help so many people, and we don't. What malaria means to me is that a lot of people are hurting. 
a lot of people are dying and we have the opportunity to help. A ridiculously small amount of money means that these people can have a zinc roof for the cost of lunch in the local diner, for the cost of lunch at Fire and Ice, for the cost of a Skepticon drink at Fire and Ice. You could give this person a zinc roof, which would last her lifetime and means that all of her belongings are safe instead of constantly being destroyed by water damage. What malaria means to me is that the world is not a fair place. It means that sometimes bad people, sometimes people who are well-intentioned but have awful repercussions are the ones that get to decide how people's lives change. And it doesn't mean good things. It means that we have to be conscientious of the decisions we're making. It means that everything that we do has ramifications that we need to pay attention to and we can't allow the worst fucking superstitions to kill people. What malaria means to me is that I now talk about paths a lot. Because Pathfinder's project, I have a fun album that's my rotating desktop of paths. It means that I have to balance talking about some of the worst things that I can possibly imagine with fun jokes to make it so it's palatable. Because otherwise I would just cry every day. What malaria means to me is that we can come together and do this. So on Monday, the Humanist Service Corps application window opened. On Monday, until the 15th of December, 14th of December, until midway through December, you have the amazing opportunity to sign up and make a change. Several people have already come to me, several people have already applied just from at this conference. But you can spend six months, roughly, and be able to help people accused of witchcraft, some of the most disadvantaged people in the world, some of the people going through the worst things, they are dying of thirst and starvation and diseases that are easily preventable. They're spending their entire lives. Some people who go there when their children never get to leave, because you don't get to leave, they're concentration camps. They've been around for hundreds of years and they'll probably be around for hundreds more, but we have the ability to make it so that people don't die for lack of water. We have the ability to make it so that people can have lives, that they can be happy. Right now, they survive. Most of them survive. But it is a daily struggle. Their government has disenfranchised them. Their communities have kicked them out. We can do better. We need to do better. So you can go on pathfindersproject.com or um, the Human Service Corps website, which currently is foundationboundbelief.org. Click under uh, humanist volunteering. Otherwise, I have a table right there. You can come visit me, talk to me, because we can make the world a better place in a very easy way. The fact that this sort of travesty is happening right now fills me with a mixture of rage and despair, but also hope. Because for such a small amount of money and time, you can change someone's lives. It seems like such an utter waste of a life to not, a waste of our lives, a waste of our time and money to not do that. Last three photos didn't load, so I'm just going to really quick run back. Hey, look! Fun memories that aren't nearly as sad. Yay! So, I am Ben's sweater vest. Photos, come on. I am Ben's sweater vest, and I got malaria, so can you.